All right, so um, we're going to switch gears a little bit in terms of, um, you know, our, our goal here is not to um, uh, help people understand um, how to do better reproducibility, but it's just a way to measure it. So um, we have been doing this for uh, about three years now, three, four years. Um, and uh, this year we've actually culminated into um, creating a paper about this and uh, an index. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, it's the rigor and transparency index. This um, we think is a, met uh, a metric of uh, methods quality for the biomedical literature. Um, the authors on this paper are um, primarily Joe Menke um, from my lab um, and uh, Psycrunch, uh, uh, Martin, uh, Barack, and, and Marianne. Um, this uh, is mostly supported by um, NIH and a little bit of um, outside of NIH. All right. So oh, now it doesn't. There we go. Um, so one of the main things uh, when trying to measure rigor criteria is that this is a very labor intensive process. This is one of the kind of classical papers, uh, which was pub published in, in 2007. The authors um, actually read and, and uh, categorized about 500 papers here, um, looking at things like randomization, blighted assessment of outcome sample size calculations and um, and the whatnot. And uh, you know, this is again one of the, the uh, papers that really became uh, the impetus for um, for some of the NIH criteria, which is great. Um, but again, reading 500 papers versus what comes out in the scientific literature is very different. So um, we actually created a tool called SciScore to um, actually uh, you know to interact with authors. Um, on some of these criteria. So for example, SciScore checks um, things like blinding, randomization, sex as a biological variable. Um, it checks whether the authors had actually done a, a sample size calculations or not. And then uh, it checks whether the a bunch of different uh, research resources or reagents are actually findable if uh, you know they contain enough information for us to be able to nail down which which precise ingredient, which precise uh, resource that is, including things like antibodies, cell lines, um, oligonucleotides, plasmids, and um, various other tools. Okay, so um, the uh, you know so the the uh, end game here <laughs> is the uh, the big thick uh, black line here which is a plot of an average uh, score for all of the papers across uh, from, from 1998 um, until 2019. So um, essentially the tool, the way it scores um, is uh, it takes the paper and it says, okay, did you do blinding? If you did blinding, uh, if you address blinding in at least one sentence, then um, you get a point. If you don't, you don't get that point. With key biological resources, if they're findable, the authors get a point. If they're not findable, they don't get a point. Um, we took uh, the entire open access corpus of uh, the PubMed Central uh, database. And out of that, we built um, essentially this graph and some other, uh, some other pretty graphs as well. Um, so this is the average score. So you can see that in about 98, um, the average paper had uh, addressed two out of 10 of these criteria. And by the time we get to 2019, um, the average pa uh, paper actually addresses uh, just over four out of the 10 criteria. Um, so that's great. You know, we're, we're um, as a field, we're doing much, much better. Um, but, you know, it, we could do a little better still, I believe. Um, so, for example, you know, how, whether or not sex is described in a, in a particular publication, um, the range is between 22% of papers and 38% of papers. Um, it gets up to about 40%. Um, if you take only the uh, papers that actually have an IRB statement, but that's still pretty sad. So um, we have uh, one actually bright spot, although it's still not as bright as, as um, I think it will be over the next few years. Um, this is the level of antibody identification. So basically, you know, how many antibodies have a catalog number? And again, if you look here in the, in the 90s, that percentage is about 10%. Um, again, not very surprising compared to what others found, 
But there's a pretty big shift here um, that actually changes this overall slope of this line um, from, you know, in the on the average of 25% in by 2016, 2015, 2016, um, up to about 45%. So this uh, shift in the curve is really being driven by some journals like Cell in eLife, which are uh, using uh, persistent unique identifiers called RRIDs for this research um, resource uh, identification. And those um, have highly identifiable um, antibodies. And so that is really picking up the, the uh, whole slack. And because these are big journals that use a lot of these, um, we're actually getting a pretty, pretty nice shift in the, uh, in the curve here. Okay. So what we can also do by using uh, these kind of numbers is we've actually been able to take a look at what the effects of some of these checklists have been. Um, this is a figure uh, that basically looks at uh, nature. We know that nature had implemented a checklist between 2013 and 2015. They really did a lot of work with their authors trying to get after them. And this is the outcome. So basically the, again, the average psi score went from uh, just over two um, up to about a four and a half. And this is largely driven by this, uh, this inflection point here between 2013 and 2015. Um, the individual criteria here, I mean, they're, they're not really doing, uh, uh, they're still not doing great in terms of things like power analysis. Um, uh, but they're doing a lot better than they were. So checklists do make a difference, especially when you really go um, after the authors and ask them uh, multiple times uh, as they, the uh, fine um, editors of, of Nature did here. Um, so things like uh, randomization um, really went up. So this is great. Sex is a biological variable was being addressed many, many more papers. Um, you know, after the checklist was implemented versus before. So all good things, but again, there's uh, still quite a bit more room to grow here. Okay, um, we were asked uh, a question, does this have anything to do with the impact factor? And um, we did the analysis and the answer is uh, they are completely unrelated metrics, just in case anybody was wondering. Um, so question, really, what's next? What, what do we do with this, uh, this thing? So uh, this, this thing, this uh, auto naginator for journals um, was actually built by um, specifically to help authors um, determine how their papers are doing. And this is a, a workflow that we've pulled together now for um, with the uh, uh, e-journal press submission system. This is the implementation at AACR where the um, author comes into um, one of these journals and uh, they are asked to specifically submit their method section into a special box. That submission results um, in a, uh, an email that gets generated to the author um, and of course a score that's visible to the author, um, the reviewers and the uh, editor. Um, that also comes with a uh, report from um, from the tool that tells the author, hey, we were able to find your um, IRB statement or we were not able to find your randomization statement or whatever it happens to be. Um, and the nice thing is that, so this is just in the first three months of use of the tool. And here we're not really, um, you know, looking at whether uh, the, you know, this is a, a particular paper that is uh, being submitted or resubmitted or re-resubmitted or any of that. Um, so we're just looking at the average daily sci score um, that is being submitted to any of the AACR journals. And it does appear to be the case that the uh, there's a trend line. It's the, uh, the scores are going up very slightly. Um, so, well, actually not so slightly, about half a point in, uh, in three months. So that's fairly good. Um, this is based on about uh, 5,000 manuscripts sub uh, submitted. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much uh, for listening uh, on behalf of the authors of uh, this paper, which was just published in November. Um, and if you are curious about your favorite journal, uh, please uh, check out SciScore slash uh, RTI. And uh, uh, I would just like to point out that uh, two of the 2019 um, top journals, Neuron and British Journal of Pharmacology, 
have been, uh, you know, on our list of journals that we've worked very closely with. Um, a lot of the others are um, clinical, so they tend to uh, have to address things like sex as a biological variable and uh, randomization of their trials and whatnot, um, probably a little more frequently than the preclinical work. Um, but in general, um, if you are curious about any of this, please uh, contact me.